What I've noticed and recognized that the three of our speakers have touched on is the importance of fellowship and community and accountability. Um, I just want to highlight, there's an awesome resource called Covenant Eyes. Um, it helps people live porn free with confidence. So it's like um, internet a browser filter and also gives accountability partners um, for those who are struggling with this, um, with the topic of pornography. And um, it's just a great resource that you can use and you can refer to other people. And we actually are talking to Sam Black and he is the Vice President of Business Development at Covenant Eyes and creates partnerships with like-minded organizations such as Summit Ministries as well. And he joined the Covenant Eyes team in 2007 after 18 years as a journalist, serving as a reporter and an editor for newspapers and magazines in six states. So Sam, thank you again for joining us. And due to your background and experience with Covenant Eyes, I'd like to pose a question for you. What is, why is it so difficult to escape the grip of pornography? Hi, Faye, thank you so much. Uh, that's a great question. Why is it so hard? Why is it so hard to stay away from pornography? There are young men and young women watching this right now going, you know, why is it, I wanna do the right thing. I wanna be a follower of Christ. I want to uh, not be drawn into this and yet I keep coming back. Why is that? Why do I feel like I'm stuck? Well, I think that's a very good question that, that's important to ask. And so uh, I'm gonna walk you through this and I walk through this, I tell you about this from personal experience as well. And um, I just uh, helped a team lead the SHE Virtual Recovery Summit for women who are struggling with pornography, had more than almost 2,100 uh, women attending this, seeking their own recovery from pornography. You see, God designed us in mind, body, and spirit. And you see, this brain up here is God's design. He created it. Sex is his design. He created it. But you see, pornography is not sex. It's a hijacking of what God created. Let me say that again. Pornography is a hijacking of what God created. And so it impacts the neurons in your brain. It impacts all those neurochemicals in your brain, but it's also fake and doesn't give the satisfaction as God designed it. So we're continually going back for more and more just because it's not satisfying. Now, the, one of the biggest issues for young men and women today is that they were exposed to pornography at a young age through these devices, right? I'm talked to regularly to uh, young men and women who said they were exposed at six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old. And then over time, they were exposed again and saw it again. And then maybe they began using it to feel better when things would, you know, I came from a, a home that was violent. And so I would go to pornography, not even realizing it, to self-soothe, to escape. My anxiety, my fears, maybe bullying at school, whatever it was, it became an escape. And so over time, this repetition builds neural pathways in the brain that begin to crave it. That repetition is important because you see, you know, you probably did something for the first time and it was hard to do, but you did it a few times and it became easy, right? And the same thing is happening, only there's a fireworks show that's applied to the use of pornography all those neurochemicals going off. And at that young age, you were probably very shocked at six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, whatever it was that you were exposed. And those neurochemicals fired off of dopamine and norepinephrine, and they really burned that memory into your brain. You can probably remember where you are or who you were with. So pornography literally had a very big impact on your brain. And with that repetition, people begin getting stuck. And that repetition is very important. Again, builds neural cravings for pornography in the future and people get stuck in what's called the porn rut. And let me share my screen. I wanna show you something, these four words that describe the porn rut. The first is sensitization. You may find that uh, after this repetition has happened for a little bit, that now you're very sensitive to it. 
um, that maybe you're scrolling through TikTok or Twitter or Instagram and you see something that's a little provocative. It's not pornography, right? You can reason with yourself, but it's tempting. It's something that has some sexual tones to it. And, and now you, you go looking for it. Now you go actually go looking for pornography itself. So you're being kind of, again, sensitization, just being very sensitive. Number two, triggers. And triggers can be being hungry, angry, lonely, tired, stressed, upset, uh, isolated, bored. These triggers then lead to what we might call rituals that you're triggered. And then you go through this little process of heading toward pornography. Maybe it's edging on sexualized media on social media or something else, staying up late watching something you know you shouldn't watch or getting time alone or whatever it is, it begins a ritual to get there. And desensitization comes in because the first thing you saw maybe was, may have been very shocking actually in today's age. But wh what people tend to do is they increase their dosage. Maybe they need it more often, or maybe they need um, something more violent, a uh, harder core, a very specific, specific act or something like that that's really coming and burning in your mind. And you have to go to that next level to get that same high you're chasing like an original high. Number four is hyperfrontality. And that means that prefrontal cortex of the brain, that brain that God designed for you. The prefrontal cortex is your thinking part of your brain. But it's become weak when because it said yes to pornography so many times, but saying no now is hard. And so what we need is a renewing of the mind, as Paul said, and that's both spiritual and physical. And so we create those new neural pathways in the brain throughout our lifetime. You do have to do this throughout your lifetime. You can ignore bad habits for good, spiritual, good, healthy habits. Um, maybe it's running or biking or um, whatever it is, you know, skateboarding, whatever it is that you like to enjoy, that's anything that's exercised, especially it's heavily dopamine producing, focus on the good habits instead of the bad. Number two, and part of that renewing of the mind is confession. James says, confess your sins to one, the, one another so that you might be healed. And so God forgives, but the confession, the to each other, God heals in community. So God forgives, but we heal in community. And so I want to encourage you as you're, you're talking today that you think about who can I talk to well about this? Who's going to encourage me well? And I just want to uh, uh, turn this back over to Faye and your panel and talk about uh, more deeply into how we can get through confession, healing, in our greater community. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. Pleasure to have you here. So um, as we promised, we're going to do our panel discussion. And um, you guys have asked so many good questions. And we're going to try to get to as much as possible. And we're going to have our speakers, Dr. Jeff Myers, Dr. Joni DeBrito, and Gabe Dalvan. Um, just going to sit down and have a discussion. So welcome to my living room. <laughs> hey, Faye, we saved Hello. the chair for you. Thank yes. you. <laughs> did you bring us a latte? I did not. Oh, <laughs> that's right. That's a different living room. That's oh, a different, yeah. different <laughs> living room. Oh, different you don't room. want to get a stain on my carpet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, you've done a great job. Thank you for leading you us have. through it today. We were just talking about you when you weren't here, but we were talking about what a great job you've been doing. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. You just have a lot of questions, so I, I'm not sure about it, but I'm good. <laughs> Um, so one of the uh, questions that got a lot of attention, um, is there a demonic element to mental health and how do we distinguish it between, you know, demonic element and is it biochemical? Okay, so I'm going to tackle this as a philosopher mm -hmm. who's tried to become a theologian and not all that successfully. <laughs> so. Um, Scripture tells us a lot about what Satan is like. Satan is real, Scripture says, that evil is real and that it is personal, okay? that it has a, a personality. And there's a 
there's a there's an in other words evil is on purpose it's intentional and its goal is outlined by scripture that satan intends to steal to kill and to destroy to to, to steal away from us god's good gifts and to kill that in us that is an image bearer of god and then to as a result destroy the work of god in the world as god builds his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven so demonic activity is so much bigger than mental illness you know so you would have five percent of people maybe who would be diagnosed with a mental illness a hundred percent of us are going to experience spiritual attacks so it's really important to recognize that because things we've seen in the movies about demons sort of look like what a person going through mental illness does to cry out for help, that we begin to confuse those two things. And that's a little bit of the theology behind it. I know you guys have things to, mm -hmm. to add to it. Well, I think I mentioned before that the enemy definitely is, is talking to us and making us think things that are not true. And so to that extent, I think there is some involvement. I mean, the way I think about um, the enemy, the way I think about Satan, is that he takes places where we are vulnerable in life and he exploits them. Um, where I would draw the line is that, and, and I think this is really important to know, that sometimes people will look at people dealing with mental illness and dismiss them and say, that person is demon-possessed. And I don't think we want to give that message. I don't no. think that is something that is very, very rare. There are cases of it that um, I believe it is a real phenomenon, but it's a very unusual phenom phenomenon. And if you think about yourself, maybe you have dealt with a mental health disorder, how difficult it is to feel the lowest of the low. And then to have someone tell you that you're demon-possessed is really, that's really unfortunate. I mean, that's almost borders on abusive. Yeah, almost it's, gaslighting. Like yes. That's how I see it. Like the yes. moment that you're going to chalk it up and say, hey, this is going to be like it's demon possessed. There's nothing wrong with you. We just almost like gaslight or discount their experience. And it goes back to that phrase I was talking about with stigma, right? Like shame and dishonor and disgrace. Like I would rather start at, hey, maybe this could be a mental health illness than lead it to the demonic versus start a demonic and then work backwards from there because mm -hmm. um, it could cause this person not to get the healing that's necessary for that process. Um, but although spiritual yeah. and physical are happening at that time. And, and we don't want to minimize that, that, there, that there is demonic activity oh, that, totally. is, that is real. Um, there is such a thing as demon possession. I've right. seen it. Other yep. people on our staff have yeah. seen I have, it. We I have can as well. You know, we, this is what happened. This was real. This was yeah. a real experience. Um, I, in my study of scripture, I believe that those who are redeemed by Jesus Christ, who claim him as their savior and as their Lord and their lives are dedicated to serving him, can find themselves being oppressed by demon yeah. activity. But I wouldn't, um, I, 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 I would distinguish between oppression and possession maybe. Right. Yeah. 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 And I, I hope that I'm okay on this. There are people who have written extensively on this. I know Dr. Carl Payne, for yeah. example, wrote a book on spiritual warfare. Yeah. And I, I met him because his son came to Summit many, many years ago. He's oh, a wow. Summit dad. So I know there are other people who can give more insight into that. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Wow. And you know, I'm just going to share a really personal story here. It's a funny story, um, but it makes that point that there was a time in our country when any number of physical maladies were thought to be demon possession. And so my mom used to tell a story that she and her family members would get together every Sunday after church and have dinner together. And the kids started noticing that Aunt Hattie, Hattie had not been there for a while. And so they said, where's Aunt Hattie? And all of a sudden the whole table got hushed and everyone went around and whispered to one another, she has cancer. It was cancer. And it was at a time in our history mm. where they thought cancer was caused by demon possession or God was striking someone down with cancer because they had done something bad. And I mean, obviously, we've evolved to the point of realizing cancer is not demon possession. That's right. not what yeah, it is. Yeah. And I almost feel like that's kind of where we are with mental health, that because 
people weren't talking about it. There was this kind of a mystical yeah. thing yeah. around yes. it. And the more we do these kinds of things and talk about it, the more it helps people understand this is like other illnesses. Well, it's that whole conversation of whatever you keep hidden stays hidden. Yeah. Whatever you bring light to, the Lord can add, the light's on that now. And, and right now, in our faith communities, mental health needs to be shined on. It needs to be discussed, yeah. and it needs to be a broader subject, yeah. more theology, more understanding, so that individuals sitting in that seat that's not figuring out what's going on doesn't feel like, I'm demon possessed. I must be the worst thing ever, but I still love Jesus, and I, and I want Jesus to be my Lord. I, I, he is my Lord, and having all those confusions because the enemy works within the context of confusion, mm -hmm. and just one small piece, he'll, and it clicks the whole thing over for them, and so that's why that, you're right, it's got to stay open, and it's got to stay conversational. Um, it should never be off the table in the midst of topics of, of the, uh, you know, theological topics or anything like that. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that our base camp today shed some light on that yeah. and maybe as a baby step in, in that direction, well, that be would awesome. be a great outcome. That'd be awesome. Yeah, yeah. I like what you said about your Aunt Hattie. I just thought of, you know, back in the um, early 1900s, you know, women, older women had hysterics, you know, oh, the hysterics. Yeah, yeah. No, it's <laughs> menopause. Like, it's, it's normal. Right. <laughs> it is very um, normal. <laughs> I can attest to that. And there is such a thing as menopause as well. Yes. Yes. So don't, this is true. Yes. don't let men no. tell you yes. what is menopause? that they, it, they... You're not off the hook, man. No, no. Old men get grumpy. I don't know if you've ever seen this on TV or yeah. anything, but... Uh, Oh. Yeah, don't stigmatize that. Yeah. Don't, don't. I feel like my <laughs> grandfather has gotten even more it. sweeter. Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> That's good. But yeah, he might have averted it all. Yeah. <laughs> um, so our next question comes um, from Katrina. Thank you, Katrina. Um, after losing a fellow Christian to suicide, mm -hmm. how do you remind people that the way they didn't die doesn't determine their salvation and their relationship with Christ? I'd like to tackle that one. And yeah, then, go um, for it. Please so I, I recently lost a friend to suicide, so this is very, this is very current for me, very personal. Um, I want everybody to know you are not the worst thing that you have ever done. That suicide is a grievous sin. But the question about salvation is really simple, and there's only one sentence to it. Have you got Jesus Christ as your Savior? Um, the sin of suicide is difficult because most sins you have the opportunity to be restored from it, and that one you don't. But it's Jesus Christ's saving work in our lives that will uh, determine our eternal destiny. And I wanted to, I just brought my little Bible over, and I brought my superpower glasses nice. too because the Bible is so small. Um, <laughs> tiny little big, big words. Okay, all right, but I, I want everybody to hear this. Romans 8, starting in verse... Uh, 38, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will have the power to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Come on. Yeah. Powerful. This is a tough subject and question to answer because we don't like unanswered questions as a, as a human being we don't like unanswered questions and whenever I hear that question within the faith community I always want to go back to that we are created in the image of God and this is a human being and as a human being losing their life there is a grieving process regardless of how that death happened there's a grieving process and we have to remember that others around us will grieve it differently. Others around us will feel sad and sorrow for moments and then all of a sudden be great and then feel that sad and sorrow again. And if we try to focus so much on this idea, that are they saved, are they here, where they're unanswered questions, we're not going to navigate the process of what the Lord is asking us to do mm -hmm. as we've experienced this because we're still here on earth. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why... Um, uh, Joni, you, you, you were, we were talking about that right before you got up here, of how in our culture, especially in the faith culture, we've got to learn to grieve well. Mm -hmm. yeah. We've got to learn to grieve 
well and understand these this process of grieving and then what it looks like because um i mean jesus gave us a picture of that when he when he wept and then we heard him say it it just says jesus wept there in john and and i think sometimes we gloss over that not realizing that was jesus grieving that was jesus truly grieving and i I can feel your grief for your friend. I can feel your grief for the loss. But if we don't get in that witness in with you in that loss, then we'll gaslight you and we'll, we'll put you in a place. And we've done that in our faith community. Why? Because joy comes in the morning, right? Yeah, yeah. It's tomorrow, so let's start over again. Mm-hmm. It's going to be fine. Mm-hmm. Jesus is still with us and we're still here. And that's great. Right. But you're still hurting, so I need to get in that hole with you and hurt with you. That's what true connection, of community, and witness looks like. So that's my thought on that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that point of witness, or that we're that we are a witness to one another's pain. You could hear that come through Joni, mm-hmm. your presentation, and David, and through what John Eldridge was saying in the in the videos, and John Stone Street and Esther Felice. You could. That's the theme. Yeah. It's all. It, that is. That's the thing that ties it all together. And the thing that I would say is that. What happened just here in terms of talking about it and kind of wrestling through it, that's what needs to happen. When people say things like, do you lose your salvation when you uh, die by suicide or not? It doesn't deserve a one answer, a yes or a no. You have to have the discussion. You have to really fully unpack that and hear where other people are coming from and hear where their concerns are. And I think that within that, as you seek the Holy Spirit and seek scripture and so forth, you find the understanding, just like Jeff went to that scripture to you know, show us what it ha- actually says in the Bible. The one thing that I want to say, because I've been on the side of this argument both ways so many times, is that the next thing that people say is, but if I say that to my loved one who's really struggling and close to dying by suicide, I'm giving him or her permission to do it. Because that was the one thing that was keeping her from doing it, was that she was going to, in her mind, go to hell. And what I want to say about that is that's, that's not why that happens. It happens because we shut the conversation down. It happens because we try to say yes or no. Here's the answer. Don't ask me. It's yes or no. Um, and we ha- that's the whole idea of what we're doing here. We have to be willing, as I talked about, as you talked about, as you talked about, to enter into being with that person and it's not comfortable. It's hard to be with people when they're depressed. We want to be with people who are having yes. fun, the yes. joy in the morning, having a party. It's hard. But God calls us to serve one another and be there for one another. And that's where those answers, those questions really get answered, is in that fullness of discussion and being with them and letting them struggle in front of you and also being willing to say, I don't know. I don't know, but wow, this would be a great opportunity for us to maybe turn to the Bible and see if maybe we can figure it out together. Or go to Dr. Jeff. I think he has some ideas and wisdom that I don't have. That's that wisdom of counselors. Well, that's why I like that's why the Psalms. Could you imagine David? Like, think about David, and then you read him, and he's got these high highs and uh-huh. these low uh-huh. lows, right? Uh-huh. And we probably could, cl- like, put oh, him yeah. clini- clinically almost, in, in yeah. depression almost or, or bipolar. bipolar. Yeah. Like, he could be clinically uh, uh, assessed with that. And you see that happen over and over again with David. But we guess what we hear, what we talk about with David all the time? He slayed a giant, guys. He slayed a giant, or we talk about Bathsheba. Like, those are the stories that we hear about David. Mm-hmm. But here's what is interesting. Nobody remembers in the Psalms, he's, like, bearing his soul, and he's hurting and what if we remember that David was a human? Right. Wow. And he was hurting. And he's like, God, I don't know where you're at right now. I have no idea where you're at. Right. And it's dark here right now. Yeah. And there's a book on, uh, called The Dark Night of the Soul. Like, mm-hmm. they're, like, can you get there? But guess what? We don't. We don't want that. Mm-hmm. I ask students all the time. I say, why don't we talk about suicide amongst our friend groups? And you know what they say? Because it's supposed to be fun. We're supposed to be fun together. And so in our communities of faith, we're supposed to have faith together. Mm. We're supposed to be happy Christians. Got to play games. Got to play games, right? Got to put the mask on because I love Jesus. I'm going to put my hands up, whatever that may be. And some of that is necessary. 
It's necessary because you have to unction yourself. He said, he said, awake in me, soul, like a soul awake. And sometimes we have to do that. But can you imagine every single one of those characters are people? And they were, David was hurting. And we gotta, he, his breath is in the Psalms. And so if we as people can remember that humanity is inside that, and we're human, we're human, and understand that that brokenness is there, and the depths of who we are is inside that. That's why Jesus could sit with the prostitute and can sit with Zacchaeus and sit with the brokenness of the leopards and sit with the brokenness of communities and say, I get it. Yeah. I get it. Um, one more question. Um, this came from Missy, who's a parent here in Colorado. Um, what are good questions to ask your student to gauge their overall well-being on a weekly basis? Good question. <laughs> you know, the first thing I would say is that questions are not the best. Really, it's about discussing and being open to hearing what they have to say. So I love the words, tell me about. Tell me about your day. Tell me what's going on. Those kinds of things that just open up discussion. And just a little point for parents. Most of us, if we get to know our children well, we can tell when they're open for discussion and when they're not. <laughs> and that's usually because we've learned, I probably shouldn't have said that at that time because it didn't go the right direction. And so the next time you think, okay, what, what was going on? Oh, you know, yeah, she was in kind of a funky mood. Um, and so you wait for those moments when they're open for discussion. Um, sometimes it's joining with them around something they like, like sports or music or whatever it is they like. And as they're engaging, they'll talk to you. They don't like feeling like they're being interrogated. None of us do. Nope. And so they don't want the, where were you? Who was there? How long were you there? What do you do? That <laughs> kind of thing. They want to hear, so I haven't seen you for a while. What have you been doing all day? Or um, tell me about your day. Yep. Tell me about it. Yep. I'd love to hear about it. And, and then when they talk, Close your mouth, shut up, and listen. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Because yes. it's kind of like yes. they start to talk, and then parents interrupt. And all of a sudden, they, well, oh, I wanted to talk to you about this and this and this. And it's like, I thought you wanted to hear about yes. my day. So, so just open up that opportunity for them to be able to talk about their lives and then sit back and listen. All right. There's an interest. So two things on this. Uh, I would just say real quickly, there's a fine line between being interested in your student and being an investigator. Like no student wants a CSI detective in their <laughs> life, okay? And that's very true. Uh, listening non-judgmentally, so shutting your mouth and being quiet and listening, actually listening. And lastly, um, find the area that's the best to go have that conversation. My little girl, like she's 16 years old and she told me this. I go, how do you know I'm listening and how do you know we're having a good conversation? Easy, dad. When I'm in the car, the music's on and we're driving with the windows down. I have some of the best conversations in the car, but that's where we go. We go to have a conversation. And I know when she says, hey, dad, let's go for a drive. She wants to talk. So guess what I do? I'll spend a lot of money on gas to have those conversations. That's yeah. so good. Yeah. yeah. In our staff training, we teach, very first thing we teach is five conversation altering words. Tell me more about yeah. that. Yeah. Right. You remember we, yes. we did that <laughs> because all the time. <laughs> that's what's going to help bring conversation out. Yeah. Boy, our culture could use that too. Yes. Uh, we were doing workshops with uh, a group and where people are experiencing a lot of political conflict, head-to-head mm -hmm. -head conflict Imagine with that. one another. <laughs> and, uh, and they asked, this is just yesterday, uh, the question was, and it was from a, a law student at a prominent university, you know, what do you do when people don't, you know, when they're, they're, they just can't, they can't even get to the starting point of a conversation. Right. And I said, it's just, it's, it's talking about the talk. Tell me, tell me more about that. Somebody says, you're, you're so awful, I can't even believe that you exist as a person. Or, you know, the, the, the kinds of things people say in social yeah. media yeah. all of the time. Hey, tell me, what's going on behind that? You know, that's, boy, that's a, that's pretty, that hits me pretty hard. You know, what, tell me more. And those kinds of things that help de-escalate it and then prepare for the, the conversation to take place. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you guys for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, as awesome. Thanks, Faye.
think the buzzword today is withness. So yeah, <laughs> with I like withness. Oh, all the yes. English teachers are going crazy. Yes, they are. <laughs> but everybody else, Everybody's we're great. good. Everybody's yeah. good. We get it. Um, yeah, this is an incredible conversation. I've been challenged and learned so much. So thank you.